AOSD challenge. AOSD, watch me bring it out. Assemble the sound, doctor. AOSD, watch me bring it out. You know this, you know this, so what they say, what they say, you are a witch, you are a witch, now you're playing, now you're playing, I ain't playing with your plans, come to cross the land, I'm powering up with higher guys like super science, I can do it solo, kill a whole doctor with three bulls, from the Christians to the Hebrews, they all lost like Nemo, when they get them a shot like free throw, break them all down like a peephole, take some notes from the lesson, gain an honor, get the muscle from the spirit, in the kingdom, that's a keyhole, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom. Hope you're having a fantastic evening. This is Elvin Israel from the Assembly of Sound Doctrine Challenge. And yes, your eyes are not playing tricks. You have not been deceived. This is the second lesson for today on this glorious November the 26th. And on my YouTube channel, of course, it's going to be a little bit later. And I uh, just got a message. But hopefully we're just going to go through it. Hopefully it won't affect uh, what I got going on. And if it do, I apologize ahead of time. But now, we finna actually go strong about Isaiah 63, 1 through verses 6. And what people do. They have a tendency uh, when we're talking about uh, how we kind of view scriptures and stuff, right? You know, they run to a lot of this apocalyptic literature, and they'll say, uh, when have this been fulfilled? When have that been fulfilled? When has this been fulfilled? I ain't seen this being fulfilled. I ain't seen that being fulfilled. So today, without a shadow of a doubt, we're going to actually show when these things indeed was fulfilled. How you doing, uh? Obadiah, I'm just waiting on some of my uh, admins to come in, and uh, we'll be able to uh, take it from there. So, uh, without a shadow of a doubt today, we're going to be able to show the fulfillment of Obadiah, and hopefully when we show this fulfillment, we won't have a whole bunch of, well, it's going to be fulfilled again. Uh, no, no, nobody said it was fulfilled the first time, so now when we show the fulfillment, we're not going to play the, it's going to be fulfilled again and again and again and again game. So we're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to show when all of these things were fulfilled and how we can actually benefit it, uh, benefit from it today. So, uh, Brother Mike, how you doing, my brother? Oh, uh, my brother, uh, loving life, living in Shalom. So, uh, you know, you're the admin. You can bring people up if people want to talk. But you know how I want to do it. I want to be able to get a whole complete thought out first before the people come in and interrupt. So, um. Sir, I got you. Uh, yes, sir. And, and uh, y'all can ping anybody that you want to ping because I know this is kind of a hot topic. The fulfillment of Isaiah 63. Uh, and. When is all of these Edomites going to be destroyed, etc.? So, um, I'm finna actually get ready to get started, and I'm gonna uh, through the process. I'm gonna show how uh, the Bible actually worked from the Old Testament to the New Testament because a lot of we didn't got off a lot. So, Isaiah.
Sorry, my brother. I got something going on on my uh, screen real fast. I'm trying to get up here. Okay, let's see here. All right, there we go. All right, so now let's get ready to get started. Hopefully, uh, the rest of the group uh, come on a little bit later. First thing first, we're going to go to Isaiah 63, and we're just going to keep it out of the. Uh, we're going to take it out of the. I think I did my uh, Septuagint. It says, the Bible, who is this that cometh from Edom? Who dyeth garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, that I speak in righteousness. Mighty to save, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treaded in the wine fat? I am. I have trodden. Well, first of all, and, and I apologize for that. I want to just do verse number one. Who is that that coming from Edom, with diet, uh, with dyed uh, garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to say. So, first of all, Isaiah spoke of it first. But what Isaiah was doing, he was actually speaking on something in 63 that he had said formerly. So we're going to go to Isaiah 34, and we're going to read 5 through 6. It says, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. So now, the sword bathed in heaven, it shall come down upon Idumea. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. So now, the sword was coming upon Idumea. A, and upon the people of my curse, B, to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, the sacrifice ideology, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord had a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Adumia. So he's using sacrificial language to explain what's going to happen to Adumia. So when you get to verse uh, chapter 63, understand it had already been spoken of in Isaiah 34. But we see the prophet speak of it again. We see Prophet Jeremiah speak of it. In Jeremiah 49, 13 through 14, it says, For I have sworn by myself, said the Lord, that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse. And all the cities thereof shall be perpetual waste. So now we see that he includes the curse to Basra by the time Jeremiah got on the scene, right? So now they're going to be part of the curse too. Uh, curse deals with destruction, deals with death, just in case we don't know. Uh, 49, Jeremiah 49, 14. I have heard a rumor from the Lord, and I'm and an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, Gather ye together, and come against her, and rise up to the battle. So now, notice right here, he says, he's going to destroy Basra. It shall become a desolation and a reproach. And he heard a rumor. Now, we can't take this literal, because do we think that Jeremiah is sitting around hearing rumors from the Lord? I heard a rumor from the Lord. And an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, 
gather ye together and come against her and rise up to the battle. So now we can see that when we have the word Vajra, they're kind of linking it to heathens also. It's uh, important to understand uh, how simula uh, similarities work. But I want to read Obadiah 1 and 2 now. It says, <clears throat> The vision of Obadiah does say the Lord concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. Wow. So Obadiah is using the same language that Jeremiah is using. Jeremiah is speaking from what Isaiah is speaking on. So this is one full prophecy. The vision of Obadiah, thus said the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen, thou art greatly despised. So once again, there's no separation between Edom and heathens in ideology. So, I want to continue now. Uh, Brother Mike, since it's just a handful of us, would you like to add anything before I continue? Uh, yes, sir, then. So we will uh, continue. So now we're going to Isaiah now. Back to Isaiah. We're going to read 63. We're going to read 2 through 5. This is what uh, Isaiah says. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treaded in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there were none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury, it upheld me. All right, so now we have, uh, when Edom was getting ready to be destroyed, it's being destroyed around a time of vengeance and redemption. So there's a redemption Someone is being redeemed, and others is being destroyed. So this was Isaiah's prophecy against Edom using language uh, that's going to be mimicked throughout the Bible, dealing with the Lord's vengeance, or a day of the Lord, coming upon Edom. Once again, that language is going to be mimicked throughout the Bible. So. We're going to go to Ezekiel now. And I know you guys are like, hey, I thought you said you're going to show when all these things were fulfilled. Uh, definitely I am. But we got to get the back story first. See, a lot of people jump into what they have and have not seen because they don't have the full back story. They don't get the background. They don't understand what the prophets were saying. So we're trying to get all of the things that the prophets. So I'm going to go to Ezekiel 25. I'm going to read 12 through 14. It says, Thus said the Lord God, Because that Edom had dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and had greatly offended and revenged himself upon them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I would also stretch mine hand upon Edom and would cut off man and beast from it and I will make it desolate from Teman and they did and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel 
and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, said the Lord God. Okay, this is something very important here that a lot of people uh, uh, overlook. They don't actually try to take these things into consideration. So this is the first thing to take into consideration. The father didn't want to destroy Edom just because. He didn't was like, oh, Esau, I hate. I'm going to destroy him. That's not what happened. He said, because Edom dealt uh, against the house of Judah by taking vengeance. So if anyone understands here, we have a time period during the Babylonian captivity when King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and, to, and destroys Jerusalem. And woe and behold, Guess who jumps on the Babylonian side? The Edomites. When uh, Moses was leaving out of, uh, him and the, the children of Israel was leaving out of Egypt, and they had to go through the land of Seir, guess who did not let them pass through the land? Edom. And we know how much the father loves brotherly love. Brotherly love. That's, a, that's one of the uh, things from the uh, Cain all the way to the New Testament. How he spoke uh, against those that hated their brother, calling them a murderer, and those that loved their brothers, which was a old covenant and new covenant thing. Love your uh, neighbor as yourselves. Love your brothers. All of these things, new covenant thing, old covenant thing. So, you we have bro the brother, Edom, always treating the younger brother with hatred. So now, as the time period goes on, in context, when Nebuchadnezzar comes in to destroy um uh, Israel, the Edomites jumps on his side. So now, verse number 14. I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. So understand, Isaiah came first, then Jeremiah, then Ezekiel. So this is the uh, chronological order. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. So, Isaiah, before the Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah, before the Babylonian uh, captivity, uh, Ezekiel, during, after the Babylonian captivity. So, it was always said the way that, the way that Edom had, it was going to be vengeance stir, stored up for them because the father knows the beginning from the end. I mean, sorry, knows the end from the beginning, so he's able to give the prophets these uh, declarations against Edom. So now, when we go to Ezekiel 35, I'm going to read 1 through 4. Moreover, the word of the Lord, we know that it's Christ, came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it, and say unto it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out my hands against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So when they knew that he was the Lord, that's when he made their cities desolate. Made them a waste, laid the cities desolate. So, by the time we get to Malachi 1, by the time we get to Malachi 1, right? By the time the, the time of Malachi comes, we're going to read 3 and 4. It says, And I hated Esau, and laid, past tense, his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, we are impoverished, but we will return 
and build the desolate places. Thus said the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. So, by the time Malachi hit, we see that Edom has already been destroyed one time by the Lord. So we have in Isaiah, he said that his hand was going to come and have Edom's blood upon his garment. So this is a, a judgment from the heavenly father. This is the judgment that the word brought about. We see that same judgment spoken of in Jeremiah and Obadiah. But then when we get to Ezekiel, we have another judgment that says now the children of Israel will come and destroy Edom. So first we have the Lord destroying Edom. And by the time Malachi came around, that had been fulfilled. The Lord had destroyed uh, uh, Edom. But now we have Ezekiel speaking of now the children of Israel was going to destroy Edom. So let's see uh, where that takes place at. When we go to first let me let me go to the screen. When we go to First Maccabees, right? We finna go to First Maccabees. Let me make it bigger on my screen. We're gonna read chapters five, and it's just one verse. Verse number sixty-five. It says, "Afterwards, when Judas fought with his brethren and fought against." The children of Israel, so Judas, he was an, uh, someone from the southern kingdom. Afterwards, when Judas fought with his brethren and fought against the children of Israel in the land toward the south, where he smote Hebron and the towns thereof and pulled down the fortress of it and burnt the towers thereof round about. From thence he removed to go into the land of the Philistines and pass through Samaria. So we have here that Judas went up against the children of Israel. And Hebron at that time, that's where uh, a lot of the Edomites were. He went into Hebron and he destroyed it with a smiting. So right there. We have Israel, someone from the southern kingdom, going in and, and destroying the remnant of Edom. So we have that actually being, uh, actually occurred. So now, that's at one moment. Another one, we're going to go to Josephus, Antiquity of the Jews. We're going to go to Book 13. Chapter 9, sections 1 and 2 can be found in the hard copy book on page uh, 423. And we're going to read lines 254 through 258. So it says, how after the death of Antiochus, uh, Hyrcanus made an expedition against Syria and made a league with the Romans concerning the death of of King Demetrius, sorry about that Demetrius, and Alexander. So, uh, you got you got a biblical name, my brother. <laughs> but, uh, and, and we're going to continue. It says, but, I'm sorry, my screen. But when Hyrcanus uh, heard of the death of Antiochus, he presently, hold on, let me start it over. But when Hyrcanus, heard of the death of Anti uh, Antiochus, he presently made an expedition against the cities of Syria, hoping to find them destitute of fighting men, and of such as were able to defend them. However, it was not till the sixth month that he took uh, Madaboth, and that not without the greatest distress of his army, 
After this, he took Semaga and the neighboring places, uh, places, and besides them, uh, Shechem and Gerizim, and the nations of the Cuthians, who dwelt at the temple, which resembled the temple which was in Jerusalem, which was at Jerusalem, and which Alexander permitted Sambalot, the general of his army, to build for the sake of Manasseh, who was son-in-law to Jadua, the high priest, as we have formerly related, and that's something we got to dig into later, uh, not today, but later, which temple was now deserted 200 years after it was built. Uh, Hyrcanus took also Dora and Marissa, cities of Idumea, and subdued all the Idumeans. So if people don't understand, Idumea, the name of Esau, or Edom, it finally translated into Idumea. Uh, the name went through an evolution. It went from Esau to Edom to Idumea. Or you can go backwards. It went from Esau to Idumea to Edom. No matter how you want to play that, uh, the Idumeans are the Edomites. So now, uh, Hyrcanus, or Hyrcanus, took also Darissa, Adora and Marissa, cities of Idumea, and subdued all the Idumeans and permitted them to stay in that country if they would circumcise their genitals and make use of the laws of the Jews, and they were so desirous of living in the country of their forefathers that they submitted to the use of circumcision and of the rest of the Jewish ways of living, at which time, therefore, this befell them, that they were hereafter no other than Jews. Hold on now. So what we have here is a conversion of the Edomites to the Jews. They put on the Jew laws and actually start being considered Jews themselves. This happened under the Greeks. So by the time you get to the Roman era, some of these Jews are Roman citizens. Some of these Jews are Edomites. The Bible does not make a distinction between which set of Jews it is talking about when it says Jews. That's why you got to have the historical references from Josephus. He let it be known that those that were born of Roman stock, heathens, when they circumcised and put on the, took on the laws of the Jews, they became known as Jews. The same thing here with the Edomites. Once they became circumcised and took on the Jewish laws, they became known as Jews. So that whole Israel-only stuff does not work. Because in the first century, the Jews was not based off of ethnicity more than it was based off of religious views. So now, this is two. I'm going to read just the first sentence. But Hyrcanus, the high priest, so this is a high priest, was desirous to renew the league of friendships that they had with the Romans. And I can end it right there for the first half. So, Isaiah 63, fulfilled by the time of Malachi, the father wiped uh, Edom apart. And then Edom said, we're going to uh, rebuild ourselves. So now, by the time of Ezekiel's time, he said, I'm going to use Israel to destroy you. So we see that in 1 Maccabees, in around the same time period of the Grecian rulership, we see the high priest Hyrcanus coming in 
subduing the cities of Idumea from Dora and Marissa and turning the, those Edomites into Jews, which is total subjection. Total subjection. They came, they, uh, came under the law of the Jews and under the authority of the high priest. That prophecy has been fulfilled several times. There's no need for it to be fulfilled again. And that's why you don't see no one talking about it in the New Testament because it had been fulfilled in the Old Testament and then it was fulfilled in the days of uh, the Grecians of the Maccabean era. So, yes, Isaiah 63 was fulfilled, uh, uh, the whole thing. And we have plenty of historical documentations to prove it. So now, that is the physical, carnal proof of it. Now, I want to go to the spiritual application, which would be the true application of what Isaiah 63 it's all about. But before I do that, is there anyone on the panel want to uh, add anything? All right. Uh, yes, sir. Well, and then I'm going to continue then. So. We're going to go back to Isaiah 63. And we're going to look at how the New Testament viewed this passage. So Isaiah 63, verse number 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Boswell? This that is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So we go to Revelation, the book of Revelation, thir uh, nine, uh, sorry, 19, 13 through 15, it says, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And just for the people in Isaiah 63 and 1, uh, when the Lord fulfilled it, he actually used the Babylonians to destroy Edom also. Uh, that's what some of the legends have. But uh, Isaiah 63 and 1, Revelations 19, 13 through 15. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that, it, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God Almighty. So we see that winepress. That vesture dipped in blood, that red, is the fierce, is the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, who Christ himself is. Almighty God. So now, once we go back to Isaiah, so that's how um, the book of Revelation was able to use Isaiah's prophecy about Edom as a means to explain how the heathens was going to be partaken also of a destruction. Because uh, we can read in Isaiah how heathens was used uh, 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 in a parallel with Adumia or the Edomites. So you go to Isaiah now 63 and you read 2 through 3. It says, Wherefore Art thy red in thine apparel? Sorry about that, y'all. Hello, hello. I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> Are you how you feel? <laughs> I thought it was funny what you just said. <laughs> Isaiah 63, 2 and 3. It says, Wherefore 
art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. So if uh, anybody understand, in the old days, uh, when they had to create like um, a wine and etc. In fact, I remember, I can actually remember uh, my great grandma having to do this. So this is like early uh, 90s, actually. Or uh, um, in early, uh, late 80s, early 90s, when she used to go out and she used to uh, put a whole bunch of uh, uh, berries and grapes and etc. In a, a, in, a, in a bucket. And she would actually get inside, you know, she'll wash her feet and etc. But she would get inside of the bucket and she would stump, 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 stump it and until uh her she looked soaked, looked bloody, but that's uh getting all of the juices and etc. out of the uh berries and stuff in order to make wine and stuff. So the, I saw this growing up. So I have I, and I believe this is something similar that they would had going on also. But it says I have trodden the wine press alone. So imagine uh, the, uh, stepping on uh, grapes. Imagine if the grapes are people. I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I would tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain and all my raiment. So it makes sense uh, what he's saying right now. If he's going around, now, is, is he saying that he's really going around stepping on people and they're splatting blood on him? No, but he's trying to give the audience the imagery of a, a great um, a vengeance, a great war is going on where a lot of people is being killed. So you go to Revelation, chapter 16 and I'm going to read 18 through 20 it says let me make sure this is right uh, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since the man upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great and the great city was divided in three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So now this actually saying that the wine press was used as a means to create wine. You try, you try it in the wine. You step on it. You get the uh, the juice to come out of the wine. Uh, you take that juice. You put it in in uh, like a bowl or or, or a glass or a jar, and you let it uh, you, you what ferment it and etc. Let it set and blah blah blah. You add your yeast and stuff later on, and uh, eventually it turns to wine. If, if that's if I can recall how Grandma used to do it. But anyway, it says to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So in other words, he's saying this is going to be the time that uh, the judgment is coming and he's treading the, uh, the people in his anger. And verse number 20 says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were found not. So that's uh, a leaving of the earth. The earth being destroyed. So if you actually can take heaven and earth will pass away, right here you have earth passing away. So you can kind of see with where, where he's going with heaven and earth passing away. When you see earth passing away, this is dealing with the wrath he's bringing upon great Babylon. And we know that Babylon will be Jerusalem. So uh, I want to go to Revelation 14. In verse 15, it says, <clears throat> And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. 
So we just went there just to show more of their agricultural uh, uh, imagery that deals with reaping, that deals with treading, that deals with destruction, because we find out that the grapes and etc. becomes the people. The people are the grapes. And woe and behold, in Genesis, the Messiah had the uh, blood of grapes. So it's that imagery of grapes representing people. I just wanted to throw that out there just to show that imagery show that allegorical nature that they use to expound upon certain things. And that blood of grapes is deep, actually. That's a whole nother lesson. But uh, Isaiah 63 and 4 now, this is when it gets good right here. It says, For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. So when you see wine press being trodden, you automatically got to understand this is a day of vengeance and a year of redemption. You see why the harvest is being reaped. It's a year of redemption and a day of vengeance. You see the wine press being trodden. So, we're going to show some of this imagery. So, you got the year of my redeemed is come. The day of vengeance is in mine heart. The trodden of the winepress. The blood being sprinkled on the garments. The wrath. The travel. So, we're going to see what all of this stuff is at. First of all, I want to go to Deuteronomy 32, and I got to read this one uh, out of the, the, the Septuagint because I hate to say it, the Masoretic doesn't give it justice. So Deuteronomy 32, I'm going to read 35 and 36. It says, in the day of vengeance, I will recompense. Whensoever their foot shall be tripped up for the day of their destruction is near to them, and the judgments at hand are close upon you. So now, first thing we have to understand, day of vengeance, according to Moses and Torah, when someone speaks of a day of vengeance, they're not talking about something far in the future. When a person quotes about the day of vengeance, they have to be talking about from Moses' perspective. Not from whenever they quoted perspective, but from the person who first introduced the day of vengeance. From Moses' perspective. So now, in the day of vengeance, I will recompense. Whensoever their foot shall be tripped up, for the day of their destruction is near, and the judgments at hand are close upon you. Verse 36, for the Lord shall judge his people. Understand, the day of vengeance is a judgment. You guys call it the white throne judgment looking in the book of Revelation because you don't understand the mystical imagery said in Revelation, you make it be something more than it is. You want it to be a literal Lord sitting on a literal throne, looking at literal dead people coming up to him for him to tell them something they already know. <laughs> so that's not, that's not what it's talking about. Every, they, they viewed every judgment as a white throne judgment. Every divine judgment was them being before the Lord while he was sitting in a seat judging them for their wicked actions. So what I am saying to you, there's plenty of white throne judgments inside of the Bible. Just because the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, apocalyptic literature, 
quotes it one time, that doesn't mean that that wasn't the ideal that was going on in Jerusalem. Where did John the Revelator get that ideal from? It was a popular ideal. It had to be because he just wasn't breaking it up. White means divine. It means pure. Throne is a place of where a king sit. Judgment is what kings do. So, of course, that's what it's talking about. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to go right back to it. For the Lord shall judge his people and shall be com comforted over his servants. For he saw that they were utterly weakened and failed in the hostile invasion and were become feeble. So when you see the day of the Lord, think about the Lord is judging his people. Think about him comforting his servants. So you have a judgment, you have a comforting. This is how Moses said it. So you this this is the standards that Moses created. Not me or you. Moses created judgment and doing that judgment, some people are being comforted. So some people are not being comforted. The other people are being comforted. And he saw them utterly weak and failed in the hostile invasion. So when you have a day of vengeance, you have to have a hostile invasion. It has to be there. Someone has to be invading another people hostily. You can't separate it. So now, uh, I'm going to make these uh, quotes, and then I'm going to see if, if anybody on my panel want to see. Oh, well, not my panel. It's our panel. Anybody on the panel want to say anything? So we're going to quote from Luke now. Luke chapter 21. I'm going to start at verse number 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem come past with armies. Wow. So you have armies there. What do armies do? Invade lands. How do they do it? Hostile, hostily. So this is the hostile invasion that Moses spoke on. And when you see Jerusalem come past with armies, the Romans was the ones that were supposed to uh, invade Israel in a hostile manner. Then know that the desolation thereof is not. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. What did Moses say? The Lord would comfort his people. So the people that's being comforted from the destruction are the people fleeing into the mountain. They are saved. They are safe. They have the Lord protecting them. They are being comforted from the salvation that they are receiving. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Look at the people getting salvation. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance. What happened in the day of the vengeance? The Lord will judge his people. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So the Father used this day of vengeance. Understand, there was more than one day of vengeance in the Bible. The, point, the, the important part about this day of vengeance is that this is the marker that the Father used for the fulfillment of of all things. He said, okay, there's a day of vengeance against Israel. There's a day of vengeance against Edom. There's a day of vengeance against the Babylonians. There's a day of vengeance against uh, the, the Persians. There was a day of vengeance against the Grecians. There's going to be a day of vengeance against the Romans. There was a day of vengeance against this, this person. There was always a day, there was a day of vengeance against the Assyrians. But with all of those day of the lords that was there, plenty of day of the lords in the Bible, he said this day's of vengeance was going to be the marker when all things was going to be fulfilled. So after this day of vengeance, no more day of vengeance. 
This is the last day of vengeance. This is the last day of the Lord. This is the last that we got to look out for a prophet. This is the last time that a curse is going to fall upon someone for not doing the uh, the requirements in the law of Moses. This is the last day of vengeance. This is the last time a prophet needs to stand up and cry out to Israel to come back into the Lord. This is the last time that they was going to have to gather together under the Lord and wait on salvation. This is the last time because after this, now the kingdom of heaven is here and within the kingdom of heaven, there's no days of vengeance. Within the kingdom of heaven, there's no law of Moses. Within the kingdom of heaven, no one has to be destroyed. There's no more trodden of the wine presses and etc. So now, uh, I'm going to read Luke 4, 18 and 19 and then I'm going to see if anyone on the panel like would like to say anything before I continue. So this is Luke 4. I'm going to read uh, 18 and 19. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Let me make sure this is right. Uh, uh, my bad, yeah, it's 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me, to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty to them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This, this is something that had to be fulfilled. Later on, you go down, he says, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. So, the fulfillment of this when the captives was actually delivered. See, he was preaching deliverance to the captives. The captives was actually delivered. He was speaking, uh, he was talking about the blind recovering their sight. At that point in, in Luke 21, then the blind started to see. You can find that in Daniel 12, dealing with the resurrection. Now, they that woke to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. The recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. He, set, he freed those that, had, that was under the ministration of death. But all of this had to occur during a time of vengeance. Judgment had to come along with the comfort. Luke 4, 18, 19, that's the comfort that Moses was speaking about. Uh, Luke 21, that's the judgment that Moses was speaking about. So now I'm going to uh, mute my mic and see if anybody on the panel want to say anything, and then I'm going to continue.
And that was a beautiful correlation. Uh, I think that actually deserves a lesson also uh, by itself. So uh, uh, I don't know if you mind unpacking that and actually creating a lesson for that. And if you don't, uh, I definitely will if you don't want to do it. But uh, that was a, a beautiful correlation that I didn't even think about. So uh, I'm glad that we got that on the wax and the recording. So yes, sir, definitely in, indeed. And I appreciate that, uh, Brother Mike. For uh, adding that that extra information on to it, and uh, I think brother, Dem uh, yes sir, and I think brother Demetrius is on the phone. So uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a brother, brother, brother. Yeah, yeah, I see a phone thing on your screen. I don't know what that means. Oh. Yeah, we can hear you, brother Demetrius. And I appreciate that. And, and once again, I'm, I'm going to set a, a, a picture into the group chat later on. I don't know why I got a phone on your screen. I thought it meant that a person was on the phone. I don't know what that red phone means. Um, okay, okay, okay. So you was on the phone. Okay, then. Okay, okay. Uh, and the replay, the replays are turned off, and I thought that they was on. I set them to be on, so I don't. And that's fine because I'm still recording this live also uh, on Facebook. But um, I, I set up replay in the beginning, so I don't know why it would go off. But um, I'm gonna have to learn more and more about Clubhouse. But uh, back to the uh, back to the to the lesson. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, sticking with me and and for uh, adding uh, more and more discussion to the uh, to the information that's being brought out. Uh, I don't want people to hear my voice and get drowned and get turned off. Uh, because, you know, I'm country and passionate, so it's, it's good to hear some more astute brothers that uh, sound uh, a whole lot more educated than, than I myself. <laughs> so, uh, let's, let's, uh, <laughs> I don't praise it the most high. So, uh, uh, let's, let's uh, continue with the lesson. Uh, we got, uh, uh, now we got Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 coming up. And it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So notice right there also dealing with Isaiah. Uh, this is what Christ quoted from in Luke uh, 4. He left this part out, but we know uh, 
it's actually included because we have it in Isaiah. So, because Christ himself, he wasn't going around preaching and harping on the day of the Lord. Uh, but we have the disciples, they came later on and expounded on how now, as Brother Mike was saying, these mountains and stuff is finna catch on fire. Now, these elements are finna burn up. Now, the day of the Lord is coming as a thief in the night. So, you know, you got Christ talking about it a little bit, but you had the disciples saying, now it's time for judgment to begin at the house of Israel and etc. So we actually have that uh, going on in the uh, New Testament. But we see with Christ's uh, proclamation of all the comfort that he's given to Israel. Also, the acceptable year of the Lord, that's Jubilees, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. We got to understand how they looked at this. The way ancient Israel looked at these judgments was that the wicked people was going to be judged, taken out of the way, and only the good people remain. So now let me give you a scenario, all right? Let's say that all of us are in a group together. And I, this is a, I know this is a terrible scenario, but this is kind of how they thought. Let's say all of us is in a group together, right? And let's say that uh, we all was uh, persecuting somebody. Let's say we was all robbers. Let's say all of us was robbers, right? We was all robbing people. And then uh, eventually one of us have a change of heart. Uh, or let's say two of y'all have a change of heart, right? Let's say Brother Michael, Brother Demetrius have a change of heart. And then uh, they start actually doing good, right? But I, me being wicked, I'm still being wicked. And then we're st let's say we, st we still hang out a little bit. We're still around each other a little bit, but I start taking my anger out on Michael and Demetrius also, right? So we all started in the same wicked way. They changed their mindset around. I stayed the same. I started persecuting them. And then something happened while I am around them, and I get hurt, injured, and they are okay. To them... That's the Lord giving comfort to them for A, them changing their way that they behave, the way that they act, and B, them, um, now I can no longer oppress them. So even though I'm around them, I can no longer oppress them. So now that I'm hurt, I'm injured, I'm taken to the hospital and et cetera, I am out of their sight now. I'm no longer around them. So the way that it looks is, the Lord, he punished the wicked and left the righteous. So that's how they look at them being able to be comforted and mourn. Even if all of them started off wicked, if they didn't start off wicked, when the bad people continue to persecute and the good people uh, uh, was getting hurt, and then a vengeance came, and if the bad people got injured, and the good people remained, or the good people were saved from whatever happened to the bad people, they looked at it as a time of comfort. So this is why them fleeing into the mountains, a way, uh, people will look at it like, man, they lost their homes. Uh, they lost their family. All of the things that they worked for, they had to leave. They don't look at it like that. They looking at it like, man, we got saved from what they just got put on their heads. We got salvation. The Lord loved us and gave us uh, and protected us and gave us salvation. He warned us. Now, we're not going into captivity. We're not going to be killed. We're not going to be uh, thrown into uh, the... the uh, uh, the gladiator place, uh, the theaters, and etc. Uh, we won't be thrown into all of that. 
We won't be sold into slavery and etc. We are free. So the time that vengeance came, the people who wasn't destroyed, they're looking at it as freedom. Only the people who was being evil would look at it as being oppressed. So that's why in Daniel 12, you got some people awakened to everlasting life. Other people are, are, are awakened to everlasting shame and contempt. You got some people awakened saying, hey, the Lord is the Lord, and we receive salvation to him. And you got other people awakened and saying, oh, my gosh, he was the Lord, and we didn't listen, and we got to go forth into slavery and et cetera. So that's just a scenario on how that stuff worked out. So now uh, I want to go to Revelation 14 because we notice something also in Isaiah 63 and 4. Isaiah 63 and 4 said something about the year of the redeemed. The year of the redeemed. So once you go to Revelation 14, so now notice you have vengeance, you have destruction, and then you have redemption. So in Revelation, well, let's go to Revelation 7. What do you have first? Revelation 7, verse number one through three. Listen to how it is said. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow upon the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea and it's saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads and I heard the number of them which were sealed and there was sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel so understand the hurt could not come until the sealing was done. You remember in Isaiah 63, you have vengeance and you have redeemed. So now we have the vengeance, the hurt cannot come until the sealing of the 144,000 happened. But what people don't understand is what did that sealing actually mean? Once you go to Revelation 14, start at verse number 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. If anybody don't know, according to Hebrews chapter 13, Mount Zion is heavenly Jerusalem, and with 144,000 having the Father's name written in, on their foreheads. Those was the ones that were sealed, verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. They wasn't singing the song of Moses. They were singing a new song now. And they was before the throne and before the four beasts of the elders. And no man could learn the song but the hundred and forty and four thousands which were redeemed from the earth. So that's the redemption right there. You had some that had to be redeemed. You had some that had to be destroyed. Isaiah 63, you have the year of vengeance and the year of the redeemed. So while some people are being destroyed, other people are being redeemed. Okay, so uh, now, Go to Luke 21. No, not Luke 21. Sorry, Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And 1 and 2. This is what it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. And this is what a lot of people right here don't un actually understand about what's actually being said here. And I don't see how we kind of keep mixing this up, but he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth 
for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. So the first earth and the first heaven was passed away in Revelation 21. And listen to what he says, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So if the first earth and first heaven was passed away, he saw a new heaven and a new earth. He then comes around and tells you how they speak to the Hebraic mindset, how they speak in the Hebraic audience. The new Jerusalem is what he saw. So if the holy city, new Jerusalem, is new heaven and new earth, the first heaven and the first earth that passed away had to be old Jerusalem. The holy city, old Jerusalem. Once again, the, old, the, the holy city, old Jerusalem has to be the first heaven and first earth if the holy city, new Jerusalem is the new heaven and the new earth. I don't know why we won't make the connection. I don't know why we feel that the Bible has to clearly say, but the Bible actually tells you that it's in Jerusalem, but I don't know why the Bible has to clearly say, oh, heaven, I'm oh, sorry, first heaven, first earth is first Jerusalem. I don't know why the Bible would have to say that. He's actually showing you. You can, you can just read it and get the understanding. So, uh, but anyway, we're going to get ready to end this thing. So we go to Isaiah. 63, and we're going to get ready to end it. Isaiah 63, we're going to read verses 5 and 6. And he says, And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me. And my fury, it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. So we go to Isaiah 59, 16 through 19. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness. It sustained him, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. I will repay them for their deeds. I will repay every man for his deeds. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands, he will repay recompense. So, who was the enemies of Christ in the first century? Who was the enemies of the word in Isaiah 59? This is why he was going so hard against Edom. Because Jacob represented Christ. And when Edom did what they did, it's like they was going against Christ. So he had to repay them for the things that they did. And the New Testament, using the same type of style, using the same type of voice, when Israel themselves, the southern kingdom, made themselves enemies to the Lord, they killed him. They persecuted his church, which is his bride. So not only did they kill the husband, then they go around and they turn around and persecute the bride. So he said, I'm going to repay you guys for what you have done. So now, once we go to Romans, listen to how they actually use this in the New Testament. We go to Romans. I'm going to read 11 through 13. It says, um, 
Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the resurrection. Let no man therefore, sorry, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither ye, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead. I don't know how people make the resurrection to be literal people, literal flesh coming out of the ground. I don't know how they make it be dead bodies coming up and then the flesh reattaching to the dead bodies. And people are going to be like, hey, look at me. Uh, you remember when I was dead? Not anymore. I don't know how they're going to do that. Uh, he literally said right here, as those that are alive from the dead. Do not make your bodies, your members, instruments of unrighteousness, as your members are instruments of righteousness unto God. So this is what uh, was going on in Isaiah 59 when uh, the, the word was putting on all of this uh, armor. He was making the armor as instruments of righteousness unto God, giving uh, a righteous judgment upon those nations. Uh, which would be Edom at that time, that hated him. But we also want to go to Ephesians 6. Now, I didn't want to, and this ain't a resurrection lesson. I just wanted to throw that in there since that was part of it. Ephesians 6, 11 through 17, it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So now notice in uh, in uh, Isaiah, when it happened, he was actually fighting against a nation. Here in Ephesians, he's fighting against the devil. One was against a carnal nation, and he used that same information that went against a carnal nation to say, now do the same thing for spiritual warfare. So now let's keep going. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Isaiah would seem like it was wrestling against flesh and blood. But now in the New Testament, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual, I mean, how many times Paul got to say it, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have it done all to stand. Uh, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So notice that right there, y'all. The sword, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. So when the so in, in, in Revelation, when a sword came out of his mouth with two edges, it is the word of God. Not no sword that he uh, vomited out. Anyway, uh, so now, verse number, uh, so that was it right there. So as in Isaiah, he was using the imagery to get ready to war against uh, a nation that became his enemies, uh, the word. In Ephesians, now we're doing the, or they was doing the similar uh, steps of warring against uh, spiritual evil that that was their enemies, if that makes sense. So now uh, we're going to get ready to end it with these two, and then we just can have Q and A. So once we go to Luke chapter two, dealing with this salvation, right? My sal thy salvation has brought thee, my arm has did this, thou salvation. Uh, this is Luke 2, 27. 
32. And he came by the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles in the glory of thy people Israel. And then you read Luke uh, 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be tried now of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So, this brought salvation because this was a prophecy given by Christ. And if we read down even further to verse number 28, well, I'm going to read 27 and 28 just in case. It says, and then they shall see the Son of Man in the cloud with power and great glory around this destruction that he's bringing. Now, what does it say? The Lord will judge his people with a hostile invasion. See, a lot of people want to forget Deuteronomy 32. They want to forget the Song of Moses. But right here, the Lord will judge his people with a hostile invasion. Right here, Luke 21, 27. Who was the Son of Man? That's the Lord. What is the Lord doing? Judging his people. What is he judging his people with? The Roman army, the hostile invasion. I know people want the Son of Man coming on the clouds to actually mean Christ is going to come down. He's going to sit down on the cloud. He's going to surf to the earth, and all of the wicked and righteous people are going to see him, and they're going to bow a knee, and, and all eyes are going to confess that he is Lord on that day, and all the wicked people are going to die, and all the good people are going to live. That is not ancient Israelite thought. Let me say it again. That is not ancient Israelite thought. That is modern-day Western thought created by Catholicism and started with the church fathers with who knows what they had going on in their in their whole breakdown. But ancient Israelite thought, no. In ancient Israelite thought, the the, the judgment, every judgment would have been considered a white throne judgment or a judgment or a divine judgment. So this is the Son of Man coming on the cloud with power. He's coming for a divine judgment. And in that hostile invasion, who did he use? The Roman army. And look what happens in verse number 28 when it happens. And when these things begin to come to pass, when you start to see the Roman army coming, when you start to see the, the people warring against each other, once you start seeing the famines and pestilences, he's talking to the disciples, not us. When you start seeing all of these things, he says, then look up. Look up. What's up? The heavens. Where is else is in the heavens? Mount Zion. In, in, in uh, the book of Revelation 21, Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, came down to earth. So right now, when these things are coming to pass, they are looking up. They're lifting up their heads. Why? For your redemption draweth nigh. And we have saw in uh, Isaiah 63 that judgment, the year of judgment, and the year of the redeemed happen together. We also see that the redemption, the redeemed, is who the 144,000 was when, uh, and, it, and they got redeemed when the hurt came. Before the hurt came, they was being, uh, uh, getting their head marked by the, by the, uh, they was being marked by the word, uh, by the name of the Lord. Sorry about that. They was having the Father name written in their foreheads. They was being marked. And after all of that happened, then the sea, the uh, grass, the trees, all of that was being able to be hurt 
which is the year of vengeance. But guess what? They was able to be redeemed. So all of this is just imagery about how the Father judges. And, and let me say that one more time, and then I can mute my mic. All of this <clears throat> for the crowd, for the crowd in the back, for the crowd in the front. Everybody on Facebook, everybody on Clubhouse, everybody on uh, um, uh, YouTube. This is all imagery about how the ancient Israelites viewed the judgment of the Lord. When they saw the Roman army coming in, they viewed it as Christ coming on clouds as king. And his army, his angels, would be that Roman army. And what did his angels do? Had vengeance on everyone that was his enemy. Who was his enemies? The people that said, crucify him. Let his blood be on us and our children. Let's persecute the church. If you say that, if you teach in Christ's name one more time, we're going to keep beating you and killing you. All of the people that was doing that things to the church, those was his enemies. Luke 32, the song of Moses was against Israel. And he said, Gentiles rejoice because my servants have been avenged. The servants was the church that had to be avenged. Moses created this narrative. People came thousands of years later and made it to be, be against the nations. So now it's really the nations being judged, and Israel is doing no, no, no. He used the nations to judge Israel. And for the people who was trying to hurt the righteous people, he brought his vengeance upon them also. So, hey, if you're going to be in my army, if you're going to hurt somebody righteous, I'm going to bring my vengeance upon you also. But the point was the vengeance going against the people that was his enemies, which was Israel. And when Israel received that vengeance, then it was opened up for people to come in under the Lord. That's the Bible. And I will now uh, end my... Facebook record, and if we want to do some Q&A on here, on here we definitely can. And thank you guys for listening to me ramble on, and uh, once again, I'm Elvin Israel from the Assembly of Sound Doctrine channel uh, on my profile. That's my YouTube channel. You can also go to uh, the YouTube page, Not Made With Hands. That's Brother Michael up here on stage. Um, he's a content creator also. Uh, you can go to All Things Fulfilled, which is uh, our mentors, uh, Mr. William Bell. And you can see uh, Brother Demetrius right here. He has great, great, great intel also. And he works in studies and et cetera with Mr. William Bell also. So uh, there's a lot of content. There's uh, creators here right now that can actually speak to you and et cetera. And we can dialogue. But thank you guys for listening in. And uh, until next time. Uh, y'all have a blessed one, and y'all give me one second. I'm gonna, uh, I'll be right back. Give me one second. Thank you for clicking on the channel. AOST. Assembly of Sound Doctrine Channel. Assembly of Sound Doctrine. AOST. RPK. Resurrection Prophecy. Like, subscribe, share. Let's go. Oh. Come get a lesson. I'm teaching blessings. No need for guessing. I'm knowledge testing. It's truth time. The wise will shine. And the wicked will pine. I'm a righteous kind. Break out of trouble, I'm keeping it subtle. Just me and my brothers and sisters. They love us. We're fixing the puzzle, no stressing. I come to the bunker. The struggle will unseat the guns. Wanna read it, believe it. The
should leave it. Till you did it, need it. Like a kid bag. Bridges and pieces. Like a Kit Kat. Aki's and I get seasoned. It's a Hollywood, not Dollywood. Alpha love. The kingdom within. AOS key is for missing. Or PK let you gonna begin. It's a Hollywood, not Dollywood. Alpha love. The kingdom within. AOS key is for missing. Or PK let you gonna begin. AOS key. AOS key. AOS key. AOS key. A-O-S-D, 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 A-O-